question directly addressed to me about uh, public opinion. I think it's fairly uh, accepted now that public opinion matters whether you are uh, liberal democracy or you are something else. I mean, it was way, way back in 1852 that Louis Napoleon Bonaparte overthrew his own government and then declared himself emperor by the will of God and the will of the people. So ever since then, I think we have something like a mass society which political sociologists talk about. And no government will neglect the power of public opinion as a base for their you know, legitimacy. And therefore, I think the Chinese and the Indians will use it in different ways. It's true the Chinese may use it differently from that, of, that in India. But don't think that in India it is a free press which is raising this. A lot of it comes out of arms of the government as well. So, I mean, it, it, it's the more point who is using who. Sophistication is going to be important. I think uh, the links between South Asia and Southeast Asia have itself been only being rediscovered now. It's not too far away that uh, Pakistan was part of something called Seattle, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Pakistan was very much part of it. But people say, look, I mean, what is South Asia got to do with us? I mean, there was interesting things that happened uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War. And before that, it was, you know, it was undivided India's armies that actually pushed the Japanese out of Southeast Asia. So I think as China rises and India begins to emerge, there is going to be interpenetration of these regions because by the sheer logic of the Chinese economic power, there is going to be greater integration. There is going to be breakdown of the previous conception of separate theaters. And I think uh, in that, I mean, Southeast Asia will have a crucial role in what it does. Media, look, most of the problems are with Indian media. Let's be clear uh, that it's become just a, a chaos uh, with nobody in charge. So you, you have actually a complete disregard for facts. Somebody talked about Brahmaputra. Look, 80% of the catchment of the Brahmaputra waters takes place on the Indian side of the border. But Chinese are insensitive in the sense, look, uh, it doesn't take much to consult India saying, look, you know, given what they're facing in Mekong, uh, to call the Indian side and South Asians and say, look, we're doing some of this stuff. Uh, this is not going to affect you. But Chinese don't think it is necessary. And Indians, of course, don't put all the facts in together. So it becomes one more thing to say, oh my god, Chinese are up, one more trick. So there is a problem. I mean, I think uh, hopefully someone who writes for me did, I mean, uh, that it is a terrible situation. And hopefully we'll be able to modify this as, as both sides begin to engage each other. Uh, on the Afghanistan question, look, India will cooperate with anyone who would stop the extremists from coming. That's, that's the basic bottom line. Uh, at this point, we are not clear what the Americans are up to. They might hand over parts of Afghanistan to Pakistan, we don't know. Uh, we don't know the all-weather relationship between Pakistan and China. It will actually lead to Pakistan, uh, Chinese coming into Afghanistan with the help of the ISI and the Pakistan army. Uh, we are not going to like that. The last time Taliban was there, we cooperated with Iran, with Russia, with the Central Asian Republics, uh, to defeat the Taliban. Uh, so it depends on, uh, it's a very flexible place. Your friends and enemies depend on the circumstance, and a lot would depend on what would happen in Afghanistan in the, in the next years. The last point, I think on the connectivity, I, mean, I think, which Hua was making this point earlier, I think the point I was making was that, look, that there was no physical connectivity across the Himalayas for centuries, most of this. I think whether the any number of people who travel uh, on these roads or not, you see the beginnings of the connection that's being established uh, between Western China and South Asia. So it's not just the Karakoram Highway. The Chinese have set up a dry port uh, in parts of, and parts of Kashmir are occupied by the Pakistan the Chinese. So what you have is actually uh, the, the integration of the Chinese economy, which has taken place far more vigorously in Southeast Asia, where the transborder influence of the Chinese economy begins to be felt. Some of that we're going to see in the subcontinent. Ultimately, I would say, look, India should be prepared to say, look, if a train line comes to Nepal border, I think we should say, look, we'll take our train line and meet them somewhere halfway because then you have traffic to go up and down. Uh, because I think it is still India's security wallers unable to see, look, there's no train line which only goes one way. So if there is connection between Western China and South Asia, uh, South Asia has more population, Chinese spaces are more empty, perhaps the Chinese will be more worried about opening up the borders. But for India, I think over a longer term, opening up the land frontiers with China 
will be a strategic advance uh, which will transform for the longer term the nature of the relationship between China and China. Mm -hmm. If I may, one final three of question. In the 1920s and 30s, the last two decades of life, Tagore made a passionate plea for a new Asia, a new pan-Asianism, pan-Asian renaissance, preempting what in Singapore we were going to reach in the 1990s. Is that dream of Tagore completely gone now today? There's no place for it in this new geopolitics? It's not actually, there's more integration. Many of the ideas of the 1920s are actually being realized today, at least on the economic front. But it is the political divisions that we've got to, got to manage. You go first. Uh, if I may, I'll, I'll address the question on the media. Um, I think the, the presence of the social media has become such a leveler in, in all societies that despite the fact that there is a, the official media and a very powerful official media in China, people read it really as signals of what the government wants to do. People are not even getting the news from it any longer because those are just the official pronouncements. But the social media has become very big, very powerful, and indeed it is influencing the Chinese government. Uh, the South China Sea has become one of those uh, uh, issues that uh, what started off as the Chinese wanting to get the, the citizens interested has driven them into a position where you know they have to, to be careful that they are not being led by ultra-nationalist uh, uh, sort of views. And curiously in this whole thing, or maybe not curiously, the least powerful of the ministries in this whole debate is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs really unimportant. Their perceptions and the reports of each other, uh, I, I don't follow the Indian press as closely, but the Chinese press on India is relatively little. I asked to check what was the reporting on the rape in Delhi inside China. Well, the answer was that there were all the, the news reports. What was the interest of the netizens? Some not very great, they, they, they didn't seem to uh, create as much of an interest that even in Singapore. In Singapore, there was a lot of reaction to it. Uh, the official uh, reaction, zero. Nothing to do with us. Maybe much of this happens in China anyway. So what's the big deal? So it does have, it, the, the understanding between the, the, the two large countries, uh, India and China, is actually not very strong. Now, whether the Tagore uh, uh, ideal will come about, I think may come from just the people. The number of Indians now living in China has really been increasing quite substantially, even in a period of six years that I've lived and visited China regularly. Just the number there. And I guess it's driven by economics, very simple. Uh, but the knowledge of it is, is not high. In Southeast Asia, I, I don't know if the influence of India is felt as much as the influence of China. In my years in Thailand, I've always found it very interesting that the Indian ambassador told me that she can read all the signs written in Thai because it's Sanskrit, but she doesn't know what it means. You know, it's just like many Chinese who read uh, Japanese uh, katagana, hiragana, and kanji. You can read the words, but you know it has a totally different meaning. But as far as the Thais are concerned, they somehow don't recognize that so much of that culture is India-based. They, they, they would prefer not to see it that way. And uh, perhaps India has not just done such a, as good a job uh, in this uh, soft power side of things. I think the Chinese influence in Southeast Asia is a little greater because of the diaspora. It's really the diaspora. As that's bringing in. But there, there is much, I think, that, that India, we call it Indochina because that was supposed to be a meeting point, right? But it isn't. It, it's not really that meeting point. Uh, but I think that in Southeast Asia, the orientation currently is towards China because of the economic uh, imperatives. But uh, in Singapore, at least, I think, 
uh, we've been driven to say, let's focus and, and, and take a lot more interest in India. It, it's been paying off uh, in, in some way, not as much as China, but because the Chinese economy was growing at the rate that it was going. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Last two minutes. Not much to say. One is about, again, raising a question for debate, Raja, about the connectivity. I have, uh, both in Bhutan and Nepal, there is, a, there is a very strong resistance to connecting directly with China. And I guess some of them have said the Chinese themselves would be worried if, uh, because of the Tibet uh, situation as it is. And similarly, towards Xinjiang, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan, that if there is a free movement, uh, therefore, this free engagement is uh, actually a problem uh, not of India, uh, so far as South Asia is concerned, not for other countries, but largely of China so to what, what, what extent. Well, it's a question of economic capabilities, whether you can build roads into and, and connections into that area. So that's a, that, that's a different issue. Uh, secondly, is very briefly on India, India learning from China. I think Raja said very well, uh, that India has learned in economic area with China as much as it is possible. And I might say it for the young ladies concerned that the Chinese have also tried to learn uh, from India in areas, and I mentioned you one, riot control. <laughs> after, you know, that's a fact, after Tiananmen Square, they sent a delegation to see how, when huge crowds appear suddenly from somewhere, how to manage them without indulging in violence, because the Chinese forces had known only one thing to fire. So that, 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 that there is a mutual learning between the two Asian giants in a very, very significant way. Lastly, just half a minute to uh, Ambassador uh, uh, that India and China and Southeast Asia, my submission is, and I've been repeatedly saying it wherever I get a chance, that South Asia sometimes is expecting too much from India to match their concerns vis-a-vis -vis China. Southeast Asia. Southeast, 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 Southeast Asia is sometimes expecting too much. Uh, India cannot match China either economically or militarily at this stage. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we don't want to remain engaged uh, in the region, but it also mean, but it means very clearly that for every uh, answer uh, to your troubles or your worries or concerns, India cannot provide the answers and cannot provide them satisfactorily. On that note, uh, thank you for having me. I just want to thank uh, the panelists for a very engaging uh, discussion. I just hand the floor over to